we gathered under the tables and just listened to nonstop gunfire happening right outside the door. It's like playing Russian roulette with your kids. There's no way you can protect them anymore. If there's even one life that can be saved, then we've got an obligation to try. The only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. Responsible gun owners absolutely have the right to keep and bear arms in a safe and responsible manner. Hello, I'm Shihab Rajansi. Welcome to the first of Inside Story America's three-part special on guns, culture, and crime in the United States. Today, we're at the Blue Ridge Armory and Range. And on this show, we'll explore why so many Americans are passionate about owning guns. There are nearly 300 million firearms in the United States. That's almost as many guns as there are people. It is, in fact, the most heavily armed country per capita in the world. But since 20 children were shot and killed in an elementary school in Newtown, Connecticut, the call for tougher gun controls has been louder than it has been for decades. But those calls have also prompted many to go out and buy more guns. Across the country, stores like this one in Virginia have reported a massive increase in sales. One salesman told us they simply could not keep up with demand as gun owners fear that new regulations could infringe on their right to bear arms. Kimberly Halkett traveled to West Virginia to discover more about this country's devotion to guns. My dad grew up shooting. His parents before him, and uh, he taught me when I was young, starting with a BB gun. I'm ready. You ready? Yeah, let's go hot. All right, I got you uh, zeroed in. From the time he was a boy, Vincent Green has enjoyed spending time in the wilderness and shooting guns for sport. Vince owns several firearms, including a bolt-action hunting rifle. But when it comes to target shooting, he says that for precision and speed... You're uh, pounding around the second green ring on the outside. His AR-15 is the weapon of choice. But it's also one of the firearms at the center of America's debate over gun control. I mean, this is the obviously, you don't need this if you're a sportsman. Obviously, they look different. You know, this is a great rifle, a fun rifle for target shooting, just like this. Um, you can shoot these precision, you can shoot this precision. It all depends on how you set it up with the optic. Uh, what this gives you over that is this has better ergonomics, which you get from having an adjustable stock, which, uh, and then having a pistol grip. And this way it's easy to fit it to the shooter and you can better hold onto the rifle. Um, you can put a, a broomstick handle, they call it, on here. You know, I prefer this angled foregrip, something that gives me easier control and, now, and gripping it and holding that? it. Well, um, in most states, at least for deer hunting, the round that this shoots, a 223 round, is too small. And you need to have 224 or bigger in most states just because it's not considered powerful enough and humane enough to bring down a deer. Vince says those in favor of more gun control simply misunderstand how and why so many Americans like himself enjoy the sport. It's something fun to do in, you know, in the woods. And, and frankly, you know, that's where I love to be is out in a more rural uh, setting like this. Was I dinging you with the rounds? Yep. <laughs> But the American Sorry. passion for firearms isn't confined to just rural spaces like these mountains in West Virginia. Donnell Dover grew up in Brooklyn, and until five years ago, Donnell had never used a firearm. Now he manages a gun range and store just outside Washington, D.C. Last year I went out hunting for my first time ever. Yes, it was long and drawn out, but it was, to me it was very interesting. Um, my 12-year-old, I bring him out. He loves to come out to the range. Uh, I've, there's a lot of families that come out to shoot. You know, they'll bring their little kids, and it's something they pass down. But it's an American tradition that so many fear will come to an end if new U.S. gun control measures are put in place. 
That's despite assurances by the U.S. president the proposals are not meant to infringe on the right to bear arms. Open, shut, ready to fire. Growing up in the Midwest, Elizabeth says her family never owned guns, but now she wants one to keep her family safe. I live in a big city now. I've got a baby on the way. I've got a responsibility, a life to protect. And uh, I feel much more comfortable knowing that I have a way to defend myself, my family, um, should there be an intruder. The reality is, if, if a criminal has a, a product like that, if the government has a product like that, and as a free citizen in a free society, I'm denied the right to owning that product, then I think philosophically there's a, there's a bigger problem there. Indeed, an American's right to arm themselves is historic. It's enshrined in the U.S. Constitution. And it's a right, Vince says, must be preserved since millions of Americans who do own guns use them safely. I definitely feel like it makes me look like I'm a criminal in some way just because I like guns and have guns and like to shoot guns. Um, and, you know, I don't appreciate that it seems like almost everyone in the media seems to uh, portray gun owners that way. For Vince, owning a firearm is an important part of the American culture and tradition. And it's a right he hopes will remain for future generations. Yeah, that's still four o'clock. Kimberly Helkett, Al Jazeera, Bloomery, West Virginia. Gun control advocates say that the fear that new regulations would endanger the country's gun traditions are unfounded. They say they simply want legislation that would reduce deadly gun violence. After losing his sister in the Virginia Tech mass shooting in 2007, one man made it his life's mission to campaign for a more effective background check system. He now works with the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, among other groups. Here's his story. My name is Omar Samaha. My sister, Rima Samaha, was one of the victims killed at Virginia Tech on April 16th. And this is her room. It's frozen in time exactly the way that she left it. A lot of these pictures are from her graduation from high school. And it's hard to imagine this room empty, to be honest with you. I don't know if we'll ever get rid of it. I was actually here. I was in this bed. It was, uh, it was in the morning on April 16th. My dad came and woke me up. And he was like, two people were killed at Virginia Tech. And the news started to spread really quickly, and the death toll started to rise at this point. We all jumped in the same car. It was the fastest I had ever driven to Virginia Tech, but it also was the longest drive ever. A gentleman who was a friend of a friend, um, he came up to us, and he said, you know, what, what was your daughter's name? And my dad was like, Rima Samaha. And uh, he said, I'm so sorry she didn't make it. Um, her name, him, my dad said, how, how do you know? And he said, her name was on the list. Um, I was thrown into a, a media frenzy the very next morning, and I was gladly doing it because I wanted to talk about Rima and who she was and how she was an amazing individual. Um, then we started learning about what happened. We started learning about the gunman and how he got his guns and how he should never have been able to purchase his guns. As I learned more, I became an advocate just naturally. All right, and uh, you're, are you going to the march? And I learned about what we could do to prevent something like that from happening again. How can, how, like, we can save lives. So I wanted to do that. I think Newtown got people to really start thinking about this in a different way because this happened to young, innocent first graders and in an elementary school. What's going on? Is there anything I can help with? Is there anything going on? After Virginia Tech, we thought we were going to see change. We saw very minimal change, and what they put on it was a Band-Aid. After Remo was killed, there was this outpouring of love and support for, for myself, for my family. And, um, you know, as we learned about the details of the tragedy, um, I was really inspired and, and felt a lot of this energy to try to work to prevent something like this from happening again. And that's really what we're all trying to do. I mean, we feel like we've lost a lot already by losing my sister. 
Those who purchase firearms at gun shows are not required to have background checks, as they are in stores like this one. And some gun rights advocates say they just aren't necessary. You're not supposed to sell to anyone who's from out of state, anyone who is um, not a U.S. citizen, etc. So there are rules even with that, so there really isn't a loophole. An individual can sell to an individual without requiring a background check, which means you don't know that, that person you're selling it to might be a felon or otherwise restricted from owning a firearm. Uh, I think it's important if individuals are going to sell to another individual that you actually do it the right way and go through a dealer. The U.S.'s gun culture can prove perplexing to some, especially given the many mass shootings the country has suffered. But clearly a love of guns is deeply rooted in the nation's history. Though as constitutional lawyer and historian Adam Winkler explains, so is gun control. Well, we often think of gun control as a modern 20th century invention, but nothing could be further from the truth. The, tru the truth is, is we've had gun control laws since the very founding of this nation. The founding fathers had gun control laws, for instance, barring large portions of the population from possessing firearms. They barred um, not only slaves and free blacks from having guns, but also law-abiding white people, namely loyalists. If you weren't wearing, willing to swear an oath of loyalty, to the Constitution, then you could be forcibly disarmed. Our common understanding of the Wild West couldn't be further from the truth. Um, these Wild West towns had the most restrictive gun control laws in the nation. Now you boys hand your guns over. Places like Tombstone, no, Arizona, or Dodge City, Kansas, famous gun havens of the West, they had restrictive laws that barred people from carrying their firearms in town. When you came to a Wild West town and you had guns, you had to check your guns with the local marshal. You'd get a little token in return that you could use to get your gun back when you left the town. Uh, and these laws were very strictly enforced because public safety really demanded keeping guns out of the hands of drunk cowboys who were uh, coming through town. We think of the Wild West as the heart of America's gun culture, but in truth it was very much the heart of America's gun control culture. We care about our president, so we protect him with armed secret service agents. Members of Congress work in offices surrounded by Capitol Police officers. Yet when it comes to our most beloved and vulnerable members of the American family, our children, we as a society leave them utterly defenseless. They're well, the NRA was not always the die-hard, no compromises opponent of gun control we know today. In fact, for most of its history, the NRA supported reasonable gun control laws. In the 1920s and 1930s, for instance, the NRA was in some ways at the forefront of the gun control movement, writing and drafting and promoting in state after state laws to heavily restrict the public possession of firearms. Uh, today's NRA files lawsuits trying to declare those very same laws that the NRA wrote unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. One sign of how much things have changed is if you look back through the NRA's signature magazine, The American Rifleman, uh, and you can go back through decades of issues in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s, and you won't see a single mention of the Second Amendment. If you open up that magazine today, you'll see the Second Amendment mentioned on just about every page. The NRA changed literally overnight. Uh, at the annual membership meeting uh, in 1977, uh, a group of hardliners staged a coup the current leadership of the NRA at the time was seeking to retreat from political activity, move the NRA's headquarters to Colorado Springs to focus on outdoors activities and huntsmen and hunting. Um, and that angered a group of hardliners within the membership uh, who thought guns were not about shooting ducks, they were about shooting criminals. Uh, and uh, they wanted the NRA to become recommitted to political activity. And they staged a coup using the, um, the rules of order uh, and a very thought well thought out plan in advance and they surprised the leadership and overnight they had replaced the entire board of the NRA with new hardliners committed to a very absolutist view of the Second Amendment. Joining us to discuss the issues surrounding the gun control debate from the perspective of the passionate gun owner is Chuck Nesby, firearms instructor and a manager here at the Nova Firearms store in Falls Church, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And Jerry Souter, author of American Shooter, a personal history of gun culture in the United States. Chuck, you were telling us the guns are flying off the shelves since Newtown, since Barack Obama started talking about guns. You have a sticker, in fact. Yes. Barack Obama, number one gun salesman. He's been the top salesman of the year. <laughs> who, is, who is buying these guns? Uh, I'd say the, uh, in the uh, 
so-called assault weapons, which I don't believe exist in the civilian market, 40% uh, of the market is women and senior citizens. Why? Because they're simple to operate. Uh, what reason do they give for buying these guns? Personal protection. And the second reason they give is they fear their government. They fear their government taking away their rights to own a firearm. Uh, second, uh, or third, tertiary, uh, none of the, the semi-automatic firearms that you can buy that look military in style are, are issued to any military in the world. The AR series and the AK series of firearms that you see today in, in the civilian market are all semi-automatic. They do not have a three-round burst or a full automatic capability. That has been regulated by the fire under the National Firearms Act since 1934. If you want to get a full automatic weapon or firearm... Right, but you can still get a semi-automatic with a high-capacity magazine or, or clip, can't you? Well, a, a high-capacity magazine, uh, what difference does that make? Uh, high capacity is what? By definition. Uh, some people say seven rounds in New York, some people say 10 rounds, some people say 30 rounds, 14 rounds, whatever. That, a number varies, okay? Uh, you can change magazines out very quickly. It's, it's, uh, is it going to limit the number of uh, Newtown school shootings? No, a person with a, can walk in there with 10 magazines, change them very quickly before he's interdicted. What do you make of the, the, the way that the discussion is handled by politicians when they talk about a common sense approach, for example? Does that, does that help you understand where they're coming from, or does, it, does that seem a little patronizing, perhaps? I think the whole concept of, uh, of gun control uh, two two things. I think it's a fallacious uh, argument as far as the idea of what is an assault rifle. Uh, everybody's perception of an assault rifle is something uh, that everyone kind of understands what it is. It doesn't look like a hunting rifle. It doesn't look like a shotgun. It's its own unique style of gun, regardless of what you call it. Uh, and the idea of who has the ability to, to take weapons away from people, as far as the government is concerned, I think that's another thing that the NRA has beat the drum to get fear. Fear is a big thing as far as the National Rifle Association, and, I'm, and I've been a supporter of them for years. And when they made that, that, that wrong turn back out in the 60s and 70s and, and all of a sudden got politicized, the argument, uh, that's when they started to get in trouble. And, beating the drum for fear and uh, the idea to be able to just make an argument that, oh, you could change magazines really fast and before you're interdicted. That's all military jargon. That, uh, that's the kind of stuff that you talk about when you're going into a combat situation. But who does the NRA represent then? Is it, is it the, a gun manufacturer's lobby now rather than the gun owner's uh, union? I, if you're asking me, I would say yes. I'd say the gun manufacturer and the NRA uh, are hand in hand, which is not a bad thing. It doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's a matter of uh, how they use the idea between what is a weapon and what is a sporting arm or even a self-defense arm. There's, there's that difference in there that uh, you've got to always honor. And I think more familiarity with firearms at an early age, that helps people understand. Well, well, Chuck, I mean, what about that then? I mean, clearly, with 300 million guns in circulation, they're not going anywhere. It's, it's, I mean, even if the government gun. wanted to take them away, they, they couldn't. Approximately for one gun for every person in the United what States. What about a public <laughs> health approach then, using um, pragmatic science-based policy to prevent injury, to look at gun design, to look at access, and just to, to the best of the ability to try and prevent people from getting killed? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be acceptable? I, I think that's the goal of all of us. However, uh, as I recall, I think cocaine and heroin are illegal. Yet people seem to have no problem finding But you can take a public health wanted. policy to drugs which is successful as opposed to a criminal approach to drugs. I, I'm just saying that trying to eliminate something like that, bad people want to do bad things, they're going to get access to it regardless of what you do. What you want to do is minimize the problem so that you can manage it to an acceptable level. But, but will that discussion be acceptable given how fraught, how some would suggest how closed the NRA, for example, leadership is anyway, 
to even discussing some of these issues because they think it's one step to tyranny? Well, there are some things that the NRA does that I don't agree with, but there are some things that I do agree with. For instance, the NRA's uh, uh, suggestion that we get a national database of people that are mentally, have mentally ill problems, I have real problem with because uh, branding people with uh, a label that is an inexact science can lead to some innocent people being falsely accused of something. Uh, now, but their concern that erosion of our Second Amendment rights, if you give a politician, what's a politician's objective? If you give a politician an inch, he takes a mile. His objective is to get reelected. He's going to say whatever he has to say to get reelected, regardless of what the facts or data really reveal. These guns that they're talking about restricting access to right now are used in very, very few crimes. Okay, I think the uh, the semi-automatic rifle may be used in one to two percent of crimes in the entire country. The handguns, because they can be concealed, are a lot more readily available for you committing crimes. And bad people, when they get them, need to be stopped. Now, you can stop handgun crime almost overnight in the United States. The will just doesn't exist to do it. How do you do that? Simple. Simply make the penalty too harsh to commit the crime. If you commit a crime and you're convicted of a handgun crime in a court of law, it's mandatory uh, life in prison, no parole. That would drive handgun crime down quite a bit. Well, um, Jerry? No, I, I, I agree. It certainly would be a, uh, a deterrent, but I also think it's a, a paper tiger. I, I don't believe that it's something that could ever even be thought of because of the just the, the penal institutions of the United States couldn't handle the volume. Uh, what happened in Prohibition back when they out tried to legislate morality and make it illegal to drink alcohol in the United States? They made drunks out of a lot of people that had never taken a drink in their lives. Mm -hmm. The minute you start to put heavy draconian laws on anything in this country, the guns go into the closets, they go under the beds, they go, uh, people still hang on to them. But sure. they, uh, but but, that's not really a way to go at it. The way to go at it is from is popular demand that something be done, and you have the the more people that you have saying, okay, we have to come to a solution on this. That will drive the legislatures, legislators, and that's where you start the root problem with the the root causes the problem. Chuck Nesby, the, the president has said repeatedly, he has no intention of coming after everyone's guns. And the Supreme Court has now repeatedly upheld the individual's right to bear arms. So what are some gun owners so concerned about? Well, I think the gun owners are concerned about the fact that they don't believe the president, quite frankly, and they believe that their Second Amendment rights to own firearms are being threatened. But what's the basis of that fear, given the assurances that we've had repeatedly? Uh, Assurances from the government have been rather short-lived. We have a history in this country of abusing the law whenever it's to the government's convenience. I'll give you a couple of examples. The internment of the Japanese during World War II at gunpoint. Uh, Andrews Jackson's uh, uh, trail of tears, forcing the, uh, the American Indians after winning a Supreme Court case to vacate their land at gunpoint and march them to Oklahoma. Uh, for years, uh, blacks in the South were feared uh, by the predominant white public because they, if they became armed, they would, would outnumber uh, the uh, slave owners of the South. So <clears throat> given those, those things that have happened in American history, uh, there's the concern that the, the uh, it's not beyond the, a very large government to take advantage of them. I believe it was Thomas Jefferson that said that a government big enough to give you everything is big enough to take everything. Jerry Souter, thank you very much. Chuck Nesby, thanks uh, for helping us understand some of the complexities of this uh, debate. Uh, that's all for this edition of Inside Story. Join us for our next edition where we'll look at the politics 
of gun control and of the National Rifle Association. But that's all for now.